evening. Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome indeed to Conway Hall and to this evening's event, The Islamification of Britain, Reality or Myth? A debate on the future of Britain. This event is hosted by the Muslim Debate Initiative or MDI, an intellectual, political and theological initiative formed by experienced Muslim researchers, debaters and speakers who aim at encouraging inter-community debate, discussion and dialogue. MDI believes that only through frank and open discussion and debate can deeper understanding be gained, relations between different communities be improved, and we hope the breaking down of prejudice and false misconceptions about Islam. Our website is at www.thedebateinitiative.com. My name is Paul Williams, and I'll be chairing this evening's debate. God speaks to mankind in the Holy Quran, saying, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into tribes and nations, that you may know each other, and not that you may despise each other. Truly the most honored of you in the sight of God is he who is the most righteous of you. And God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. There was a time not many years ago when I was fearful of what I took to be Islam, I even avoided visiting my local corner shop, which was owned by Arabic looking men with long beards. One day I decided to find out for myself what Islam was really about, and I walked into my local mosque in Regent's Park in, here in London. Though I was a committed Christian at that time, I needed to know if it was true, as many had argued, that Islam is a religion of violence bent on world domination. I read the Quran carefully and spoke to educated Muslims about their faith. I discovered that Islam is a religion of great spiritual depth and beauty, in many ways surprisingly similar to traditional Christianity. The prophet of Islam, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, once said that God is beautiful and he loves beauty. One by one my misconceptions and fears fell away and the grace of God drew me to the one whom Muslims call the most compassionate, the most merciful. And I became a Muslim. The significance of this evening's event lies in the fact that Muslims, myself included, have initiated this debate in the face of widespread skepticism about the Islamic commitment to open dialogue and continuing criticisms of our faith. Tonight, we invite you to leave at the door the straight jacket of political correctness and discuss freely and respectfully the subject under discussion. Right, I'd like to explain a bit about the rules uh, uh, for this evening. And they're rather curt, so excuse me for this. No one shall shout, jeer, disrupt the speakers while they are speaking. Anyone who wishes to make comments or ask questions should leave them for the audience participation session. And we would like to remind everyone that in accordance with the Islamic principles of the, Isla of the Muslim Debate Initiative and the commonly accepted principles of debate, that we should respect everyone's right to hold opinions and to express them, even the most unpalatable ones, as long as they are expressed sincerely and for intellectually serious purposes, and not gratuitously and in a disrespectful fashion. We do hope you enjoy this evening and gain a deeper insight into the issues. The format of this evening's debate is as follows. Each speaker will be invited to give a 10 minute, more or less, presentation. This will be followed by a moderated open panel debate for about one hour. And then there will be a very short break for no more than five minutes for calls of nature and things like that. And then after that, there will be an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions or make comments. And I'll explain more about this at that time. And to round things off, the event will end with a final two-minute summary from each speaker. And let me introduce the speakers in no particular order. Geoffrey Marshall, who's the gentleman in the white uh, suit, is uh, a senior official and central London organizer for the British National Party. 
Jeffrey was a campaign organizer for the BNP MEP elections. And the gentleman in the dog collar on my far right is Father Frank Gelly, who is an Anglican priest, a cultural critic and controversialist. He served as a chaplain at the British Embassy in Turkey and as a curate in parishes in London. And though he is too modest to mention it, Frank was the spiritual advisor to Diana, Diana, the Princess of Wales. On my immediate left is Alan Craig, who is a London councillor for Newham and leader of the Christian People's Alliance Party. Alan has previously debated against the BNP and argued that they have falsely used Christian themes to gain votes. He has also campaigned against the building of the Olympics Mega Mosque, citing its potentially detrimental effect to community cohesion. And on my immediate right is Andrew Copson, who is the director, uh, director of Education and Public Affairs at the British Humanist Association. Andrew has organized campaigns calling for a secular state, for an end to religious privilege and discrimination based on religion or belief. He has written on these issues for The Guardian and The New Statesman, as well as various journals, and is a member of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. And sitting on his right, with the cap, you, Abdullah, is Abdullah Al-Andalusi, who is a public speaker on Muslim political affairs, an experienced Muslim community worker, and co-founder of the Muslim Debates Initiative. Abdullah has appeared on various TV channels, discussing political analysis and Islamic and topical issues. On my far left and your far right, of no political significance at all, is Robin Tilbrook, uh, who is the chairman of the English Democrats. He is a solicitor who founded the English National Party in 1997. Then in 2007, along with several other English nationalist parties, he relaunched the party as the English Democrats. Robin was the parliamentary candidate for Epping Forest in 2005. Lastly, a, a quick word about two people who were invited tonight who are not here. Stephen Gash was invited from the Stop the Islamification of Europe group. He was invited to speak tonight, but has announced that he will not participate in tonight's debate. Leisha Brooks of the English Defence League initially agreed to participate, then withdrew and I understand that she is no longer a part of EDL, the English Defence League. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Geoffrey Marshall of the British National Party. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the uh, Muslim Debate Initiative for graciously inviting me to participate in this debate and to speak on, on behalf of my party, the BMP. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm here, I suppose, as a, as a pro-Islamificationist, which doesn't mean that I or my party approve of this tendency, only that we see it as something real, uh, something that we British ought to resist. So why are we becoming Islamified? Uh, the first reason is fundamental to the presence of Islam in this country, and that is mass immigration. Since the end of the Second World War, Britain has been completely transformed, starting with the arrival of SS Windrush in 1948. Successive Labour and Conservative governments have created and presided over such huge changes that our society would be no longer recognisable today to anyone growing up in the 1930s, 40s, 50s or 60s. Insofar as the immigrants have consisted of Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Turkish and others, the immigrant wave has been Muslim. So large areas of British towns and cities have become recognizably Muslim. You have Bradford, Oldham and Leeds in the north of England. Uh, you have Hounslow and Southall to the west of London. You have Newham and Tower Hamlets in East London. Tower Hamlets now has a Muslim majority, a bare majority, just over 50% of its population. Nevertheless, over half of its political representatives are now Muslim. The local schools are filled with Muslim children, and in many of the primary schools, not faith schools at all, but state schools, the figure is over 90%. So what does this say about the future of Tower Hamlets? That it's going to become Muslim? If so, what does this mean for Tower Hamlets and for the rest of us? Can this area really be regarded as uh, English in, in, the cult in any cultural sense? There are some churches still in Tower Hamlets, but you never seem to hear the bells. 
What you hear instead is the amplified noises of the mosque, such as East London Mosque, calling the faithful to prayer. Um, what's it like there now in Tower Hamlets? Well, when you walk in Whitechapel Road, you could be in Karachi or anywhere in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Uh, Muslim men, young and middle-aged, I think, sorry, Muslim women, young and middle-aged, I think, are dressed in black burqas, covering them from head to toe with their faces totally hidden except for their eyes. There are halal butchers in profusion, and also a great many small law firms, usually located above shops, all of them specializing in immigration. Certainly, they assist some of the immigrants who are already here, but they also assist in the process of adding even more to the total numbers of immigrants by processing asylum claims. What's it like to live there? Well, not always easy. There are a few Christian churches, as I've mentioned, but only in the sort of weak liberal sense that the Anglican church may be considered Christian today. Very keen on um, interfaith dialogues, that sort of thing. Um, occasionally, the vicars get attacked by Muslim youths. Last year, Canon Michael Ainsworth was attacked by Asian youths outside his church in Shadwell. They called him a fucking priest and told him his church ought to be a mosque. Bricks were thrown through the windows of the 18th century church. Um, here we can see the, uh, the canon. Um, according to the headline in the local paper, the East London Advertiser, blooded and unbowed underneath it says, uh, don't, he said, don't use ra attack on me to um, fuel race hate, please, cleric. So, uh, you know, good man. Um, a few weeks later, a, rec a rector was attacked in his church in Bethnal Green. There have been violent attacks on white and black people in that area by Asian Muslims. After the 7-7 bombings in 2005, the number of attacks increased. Here we see uh, bombings, 7-7 bombings, fuel race tensions in, uh, in Tower Hamlets. And uh, that's, uh, that, was in, that paper was in August in 2005. And the following week, there was a letter in, in the letters page in the ELA. Um, he writes to talk about the effect of the bombings in Tower Hamlets, and he says, um, My daughter couldn't get home from school on the day of the Allgate train bombing and was driven back by her friend's father. He and his wife are both artists, you know the type, pleasant, liberal, conscientious people, probably guardian readers. They would do anything for anyone. <laughs> My daughter called to say they were stuck in traffic in Cannon Street Road in Whitechapel. I went to meet them and I saw 20 Asian youths on one side of the road, a dozen more on the other, taunting people, walking by, and those in cars and buses. We were barely eight hours past the moment when commuters had been killed and hundreds maimed and injured in the atrocity that morning. I had trouble coming to terms with this spectacle of ignorance and hate. You could feel the intimidation and menace in the air. This was nothing compared with the look of bewilderment on the face of my daughter's chaperone, who sat at the wheel of his car like someone had woken up in a living nightmare. I tried giving him some idea of just how dangerous the East End had become, how everyone I knew feared for their safety. He was open-mouthed and aghast. There must be some kind of police or media blackout on the situation because it was the best-kept secret in town, I told him. Um... Two years ago, the, the Centre for uh, Social Cohesion reported that the new ideas stores in Tower Hamlets, which have replaced the local public libraries, were encouraging Islamic extremism. The report was called Hate on the State. It was by um, James Brandon and Douglas Murray. It stated that the libraries contained no fewer than 11 copies of Milestones by uh, Saeed Qutab, um, required reading for groups like Hijbut Tahrir, and I can say that, Qatar urges violent jihad against all non-Muslim forms of government. There were around 380 works by Dilwa Hussein Saidi, who had been invited to speak at uh, East London Mosque. Saidi has uh, compared Hindus to excrement. Um, there are also three copies of two books by Abu Hamza. In one of these, called Something Unpronounceable and Jihad, he tells his readers it is permissible to kill Muslims who are opposed to what he regards as the truth and cites the example of Muhammad to prove his point. And I have a quote here from Abu Hamza. Um, he says, um, when people oppose the Islam and the Muslims, although they were saying, la ilaha ilaha, uh, there is no deity but God, they were killed in front of the messenger and their killing was blessed by the Quran and endorsed by the prophet. So, 
Islam has its dark side, as we can see. But let's be clear. The problem with libraries filled with Islamic hate literature or attacks on white people going virtually unreported in the mainstream press should not be laid entirely at the door of Muslims. These problems are caused by the liberal ethos of politicians that we elect to govern us. These liberals, I mean liberals in the Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat parties, have created a culture which has allowed these dangerous influences to flourish. There's a vacuum, a sort of spiritual and moral vacuum, which has been created by liberalism, which is in some places being filled by Islam. In the BMP, we've drawn attention to the, the darker side of Islam, but we're not obsessed by it. What we need to do instead, though, to counter it, is to emphasize our own culture and values. This means that not everything under a BMP government would be tolerated the way it is now. We would ban the burqa. To we English, the hidden face is sinister and reminds us of terrorists and highwaymen. The Swiss vote in favor of banning minarets is something we would replicate. The skyline should not be dominated by mosques, which should be smaller constructions appropriate to a foreign faith. Sharia law exists, as the Archbishop of Canterbury says, in the form of arbitration and civil law. Needless to say, this should never become part of our criminal law. Finally, I would like to re-emphasize what Nick Griffin referred to recently on Question Time as a, as a truce with Muslims. I would remind you that the Labour government has colluded in the murder of some 800,000 Muslims in its wars on uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. The Conservative Party also support this war. Why Muslims would vote for either of these parties, I just can't understand. The BMP has always been against the war, and we intend to withdraw our troops immediately from Afghanistan. The BMP, were Muslims, the BMP and Muslims were right all along about not invading Muslim lands. And uh, we have other things in common too. The BMP and Muslims both support family values. According to a survey carried out this year, 63% of British Muslims thought the death penalty was morally acceptable. Hmm, pretty good. 77% said they strongly identify with the, with the UK. And the numbers of Muslims who thought that homosexuality was morally acceptable was 0%. Way to go. It seems to me, <laughs> it seems to me that Muslims could do a lot worse than vote BMP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Abdullah to give us his contribution. Can everyone hear me okay? Bismillah Rahman Rahim. As salatu wa salam on Nabi Kareem Muhammad wa ala alihi wa tayyabin wa sahbihi salihin. In the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. I'd like to thank everyone for turning up today at this very interesting debate between uh, uh, very interesting positions. I'd say that the main point of this debate is let it not be said evermore that Muslims censor the critics against Islam. It's finished. We've invited them, and we've given them a platform. Even the UAF are complaining about the outside. So uh, Islam is not against debate. We actually were the patrons of debate for 1,300 years. If anyone looks at, the, at our glorious history in Al-Andalus and Baghdad, famous debates happened between atheist, Christian, Muslim, Jew, and in, in many cases, many cases, uh, uh, non-Muslim scholars wrote books attacking Islam, and all they, got, all they received in response was a, a, a book of refutation by another Muslim scholar. So this is, in this ethos, I, we stand here today doing this debate. Firstly, I'd like to say that um, although we're debating the Islamification of Britain, um, I'm not uh, going to be apologetic about our beliefs about uh, the Sharia. The Sharia is not something that is, is a disease that we have to reassure you that you won't catch from us, like, uh, like the swine flu epidemic going around. Uh, actually, if you'd killed all the pigs, well, anyway, <laughs> different point. Anyway, um, I believe that Sharia is based on a stronger political philosophy that addresses human nature better than uh, political liberalism or fascism or communism. And I've had many debates to that effect. Uh, I think two weeks ago, I debated the American atheist and uh, secularist campaigner Dan Barker on the issue of secularism. 
But anyway, there are many points that um, uh, my colleague Jeffrey Marshall mentioned, which uh, we're going to come to. I'm going to come to in the question and answer session. Firstly, Islam being described as a foreign faith. Why is that? Is it because from the Middle East? But I thought you already followed the religion from the Middle East. Isn't Christianity? Where did Jesus come from? Uh, no one realizes this. Your, your names are all um, uh, was it Hebrew translations. You don't, you don't have Anglo-Saxon names, most of you. Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These names are not Anglo-Saxon. These are Semitic names from the Middle East. I thought one more Semitic religion you know, wouldn't make a difference, but hey. For, uh, uh, last, uh, secondly, I'd like to start off with um, doing the usual mantra uh, that Muslims do in public places. Uh, I was once spoken to a, a, a person from the press, and I said to them, why is it that you don't show enough Muslims condemning terrorism? Because everyone asked me this question again and again and again, and I go for the same mantra. And he said, well, look, if you, if you, you know, set up some kind of organization and I had a big uh, event, uh, maybe we'd cover it. So I did. I like said Islam denounces terrorism. Islam denounces what happened in 9-11 and 7-7. Let's make that absolutely clear. If you just type into Google, Muslims condemn terrorism, you'll get loads and hundreds of web pages with a veritable who's who of people um, condemning terrorism. In the Gallup poll, it, it was shown that Muslims are equally as, uh, as likely as Americans to condemn and reject attacks on civilians. Also, the issue of terrorism is not about an Islamification objective. Uh, when you hear Osama bin Laden uh, uh, going on about uh, his, his uh, war against the West, it's not to say, well, if you guys convert to Islam, um, I'll stop. My objective is to make you, uh, you, your, the West become Islamic and establish Sharia. No. Or well, his demand is, well, get out of the Muslim land and don't support Israel. Now, I strongly condemn his methods, and I think they're counterproductive if, if you are even sincere to those, to those objectives. But uh, the war, the, the terrorism has got nothing to do with uh, converting the West into an Islamic state. It also showed that Muslims in, the, in this country are actually more loyal to this country than even the British people. In the Gallup poll, it says that 77% of Muslims identified with the UK compared with only 50% of the public at large. Muslims also uh, outscored the general public for their belief in courts, honest elections, financial uh, institutions, and the media. Do Muslims desire Islamification of Britain? Do we want to see Sharia in this country? Well, the short answer is no. This country is um, predominantly non-Muslim, so why do we want to establish it here? If, if there's any, any place we want to establish it, it's the Muslim world. All Muslims have said this. We want Sharia in the Muslim world. We want the end to Western intervention. The only good thing, I think, about Jeffrey Marshall's speech was this truth of Islam, although I think they put the BNP, they got to power, they probably wouldn't keep it. But still, um, if you look at the, the most activist group, uh, with the, in the most activist international Muslim group, calling for Sharia, Hizb Tahrir in this case, according to an article of one of their internal communiques, an internal communique of Hizb Tahrir, and I found this on the, um, uh, the Center for Social Cohesion's website, they did, they did a report about Hizb Tahrir. Uh, on this communique of Hizb Tahrir, they said to their members, the party will not work to establish the caliphate in the West, but in Muslim countries. The members of the party in the West must not take part in anything related to governance in those countries i.e. they should not take part in elections or participate in civil disobedience. So if what the government considers the most extreme, uh, one of the most extreme Muslim groups, the, certainly the largest Muslim group campaigning for Sharia in the world, if they are saying that our, our objective is not to establish Sharia in this country, then what about every, all other Muslims? Of course, we don't, we, we're not asking for Sharia in this country. No Muslim wants to Sharia in this country except a very small fringe group which are uh, disliked as much in the Muslim community as they are in the non-Muslim community. Demographics. We all have saw that YouTube video uh, with demographics. Or sorry, it's the Muslim demographics. If you type in Muslim demographics, you'll see this. It's got 10 million hits uh, done by an American evangelical organization. Surprise, surprise, but that's beside the point. The BBC completely debunked that. And I'll, and I'll give some points. The, according to um, the, the video, 25% of Belgium is Muslim, according to the Muslim demographics video, when the Belgium Office of Statistics only has 6% of Belgium is Muslim. 
Um, they say that the French have 1.8 children on average, and that French Muslims have 8.1 children. P poor women, if that's true. But, but the, 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 the lie in this is that France doesn't record statistics by religion. France being in our second country does not record this. And if you want to compare for a neighboring country in Morocco, the, the average is only 2.3 uh, 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 children per woman. So what? Are the Moroccan uh, French people uh, uh, overproducing their, their countrymen? <laughs> and this is, it's com up, completely absurd. It's all made up to scaremonger. It's pure uh, scaremonger. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hine, the demographer of Southampton, uh, his research indicates that in all situations of immigration throughout history, yes, the first generation of immigrants usually have a higher birth rate, the second and third generations always align with the host population. Always. Without exception. So why is it that there's, that there's this fear that uh, Britain will become a majority Muslim state and thereby uh, it will in enact Sharia? So, in terms of law and politics, I, I don't see no Muslims lobbying the parliament to establish Sharia law. I don't see Muslims protesting uh, against the priests which are in the House of Lords saying that why don't we have mullahs there as well. I, you don't see this. Why don't people not, not, not talk about this? Why don't they not actually uh, see the, the truth and validity of these issues? In fact, Muslims defended um, Christianity. In this country when uh, the, the, the councils, overzealous liberal ca uh, councillors wanted to ban uh, uh, Christianity, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Christmas, and then say uh, that we call it Winterval, Muslims came out out of their way to say, no, we are not offended by this. You're causing trouble for us by doing this. Let uh, you know, Christians have Christmas. We have no problem with this. And again, I've got loads of references of this here. And of course, uh, they say that Muslims are against our freedom of speech. Well, if that's the case, then you know, I'd like you to explain this event. Secondly, uh, that freedom of speech, well, you really have restrictions on freedom of speech. You have uh, racial hatred laws, sexual harassment laws, libel, slander, glorification of terrorism laws. These are restrictions on what you can say. So basically, the reason for this fear and fear-mongering about Islamification of Britain is either because of media sensationalism, it is because of, uh, to justify certain uh, neocon foreign policies, uh, a brand of ultra-nationalism that is jumping on any bandwagon of hate to get power, uh, sectarian self-interest of certain uh, interest, uh, interested parties in this country, and of course, um, uh, militant atheist anti-religionists, which again hate all religion, like Pat Condell, he attacks Islam, everyone lies, loves that, but he also attacks every other religion as well. Why don't you look at those videos? And lastly, my point is that the Gallup poll shows that Muslims are, are only want security and peace for themselves in the future, and I'll finish off with a quote from Shakespeare. As Muslims, we are not alien, we are human beings like you. And as Shakespeare said, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not also avenge? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Abdullah. And uh, I'd like to invite now Alan Craig to give his contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I too would very much like to offer my congratulations to the Muslim Debate Initiative for this debate. When Abdullah first spoke to me about it some three years ago, we were at a different debate. Uh, inter interfaith debate and he, so, some three months ago. He, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, some three months ago, I said this could be this could be very very important debate. The Islamification, the whole issue of the Islamification of Britain, is a complex issue, and it needs to be a nuanced debate. And we need to hear people from all different viewpoints, and that's exactly what the MDI has produced. So congratulations to them on that. And I'm proud that. My name is on their website commending them for what the work they're doing, this openness and this discussion. I want to be fairly uh, critical of aspects of Islam tonight, uh, and that is what I, want to, what I want to do. But I want to make one or two preliminary statements uh, that are really quite important to me. 
I am a convert to Christianity, an adult convert to Christianity, and one of the first things I learnt about Christianity was the fundamental thing that all men and women are created in the image of God. Now, that, that is hugely important to me. That means everybody here is important to God. I also learnt that Jesus Christ teaches us that we should love our neighbour, and that too is fundamental to me. So I personally live in a Muslim-majority area, with my wife, who's here in the audience. On one side, we live in a row of terraced houses. On one side is a Pakistani family, a Muslim family. Our children play together. We can't actually communicate with the parents very well because they don't speak English, but we acknowledge one another in a friendly way. On the other side is an Afghan family. Again, we can't communicate because they don't speak English very well at all. But I'm pr proud to live in London which is as diverse as London is. We are now the most diverse city on the planet, possibly with a slight uh, uh, challenge from New York. And personally, I'm proud to be that. I'm proud to live amongst Muslims and Africans and Christians and Asians and Eastern Europeans. That is what the East End of London is like. And if you don't like it, you don't want to live in the East End of London. <laughs> The, the BNP turned up at a debate which I was having with some Muslims about the mega mosque, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And they went away, and I see they put on their London website that I'm a diversity freak. That's their word for me. Well, I'm proud to be a diversity freak. Everybody has created the image of God, so you're all welcome. And Muslims particularly, because that's what we're discussing tonight. I have no problem whatsoever with Muslims. Muslims are human beings. I see them around me. They want to get their children to school. They want to have their holidays. They want to have their jobs. They get on the bus like I do. They go to the doctor's surgery like I do, as indeed all the other communities. And they're human beings the same. And as a Christian, I respect them. And indeed, Christ tells me I should love them. So I love all people. But I think having said that, and that's really important, it is also true that the, in a context like tonight, we can have an open debate. I do not fear Islam at all. Islam is not something, and indeed Hinduism and Buddhism and Hinduism, and indeed humanism, as we're going to hear later, is not something to be feared. But it is reasonable in an open democracy we can say there are aspects of these things with which we disagree. And there are aspects of Islam with which I fundamentally disagree. I, as some of you will know, and indeed I think I've been invited here because I have opposed the mega mosque, which is about a mile from my front door. And I will continue to oppose that. And I would challenge that, not because I'm against mosques, I'm not. Muslims deserve mosques the same as Christians deserve churches. And atheists can stay in bed on Sunday morning if they want to. <laughs> but actually this particular mosque by this particular group, Tablighi Jamaat, I think would be very hostile to and against social cohesion, community cohesion in the East End and, and, and wider. I'm happy to talk about that, but I'm unashamed of saying that that mosque must not be built, but I'd be very happy I'm certainly willing to accept if Tablighi Jamaat put in a proposal for a smaller neighbourhood mosque for which there was a demand. I would have no problem with that at all. But I want to raise in the time available to me two big issues with which I have a, a quibble with Islam. Okay? With Islam, not with Muslims, but with Islam. The first is it was mentioned by Abdullah, Sharia law. Now, dear Archbishop started the whole debate going and said, well, it's going to come anyway and we should accept it. It's all right to accept it. My position is we should accept nothing whatsoever to do with Sharia law. And let me explain why. It is being argued, and you'll hear it from people like Abdullah and others, that we're not talking about criminal law or hadud penalties where you chop off hands and feet and the rest of it. We're talking about small family domestic divorce and marriage courts. That's where we're talking about applying Sharia law. Well, I'm afraid I don't accept that. I don't accept that for this fundamental reason. Sharia law is absolutely, at a fundamental level, is anti-women. And women, please listen to me while I explain this. At a fundamental level, you go by, right back to the roots of Islam. Muhammad himself had nine wives. Muhammad himself said that men, Muslim men, can have four wives. Nowhere do you hear that women can have four husbands. Immediately at this fundamental level, there's an inequality between men and women. And you look forward into Sharia law further, you look into Sharia courts, and you find that women do not have the same value in court, their testimony does not have the same value as men does. You can look also at divorce. The way for a man to divorce a woman in Sharia, under Sharia law and Islamic law is far easier than for a woman to divorce a man. Now, if Muslims want to do that, that's fine, but not here in the UK. 
We have our British values and we treat women equally with men before law. We think each woman is worth the same as each man. That comes from our Christian, our Judeo-Christian heritage. That is what we believe. Those are British values now. They're built into our culture. And we do not, as a society, have to accept Sharia law at all. Why? Even if a Muslim woman says, I want to be, to, 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 uh, uh, be under Sharia court jurisdiction, we say, fine, you'll have to go to a Muslim community, a Muslim society, a Muslim country. We will not accept it here because men and women are equal throughout Britain, wherever you go. So let's be clear, no Sharia law anywhere in Britain. The second thing I want to talk about, if I may, and this is hugely controversial, I want to talk not about the burqa, which was mentioned by, by, by my uh, fellow panelists on the left here, but I want to talk about the niqab. From my Christian perspective, People are very important. The person, the each individual person is very important. And the person is generally represented by the face. It's known as personalism. Your passport photograph isn't of your hands or your feet, it's of your face because that's how we recognize you. Your personality is expressed through your face. In East London we have the growth of the wearing of the niqab, the face veil. I only want to talk about that. Please hear me clear clearly. I'm not objecting to the hijab or any other aspect of Muslim dress. I'm talking only about the face veil. It is a highly hostile and anti-social piece of clothing. It is actually saying, as people who wear it, the women who wear it, I don't want you to recognize me, I don't want to have anything to do. It's a physical barrier between people who live in the same community. And if you doubt that, come with me to some of the schools in Newham. In English culture, the school gate is a great place where people mix. You go to the school gates in many parts of, 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 of Newham and you'll find actually there are people standing there who've come to pick up their children, you can be a man or a woman going to do it, who actually are saying, I don't want to communicate. I don't want you to recognize who I am. So where's the integration? Where's the communication? Where's the relationship? Relationships are fundamental. Jesus Christ said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's relationship, stupid as they say in a political context. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Yet this thing says, I don't want a relationship with you. So there's another aspect of, Islamic, uh, of Islam that I don't like and I would wish to challenge. Now, time, my time is getting on. My point is, I think, we ought to be able to debate these things. You remember when Jack Straw raised the whole thing about niqab? There was absolute furor and he was shouted out and shouted down and he never felt able to raise it at all. I welcome... MDI, this openness of debate, we can raise this. I'm not hostile to Muslims at all about this, but I recognize here we can raise it. I expect Abdullah and others perhaps will come back and say why women should be allowed to, to wear the niqab. I would like to see the debate start about the niqab, and ultimately I'd like to see it taken out of our public life, that which should not be worn in public. If people want to wear it in private, well, in England we allow such things, but not in public because it is hostile, it is against cohesion, it's against community relationships, and is deliberately designed to be so. And therefore, we should not have it. I've probably talked long enough, my 10 minutes is about to, uh, about to be up. I look forward to the debate. I particularly look forward to this thing about Sharia law. I think it's of fundamental importance. It certainly is growing, and I'm looking forward to a further debate with Abdullah. And this somewhat false concept that Muslims don't want Sharia law here in, in the UK. That's nonsense. They do. Of course, they have to want it. And I'll explain why during our debate. But that, I think, I'll do for the moment. And I hope you'll uh, uh, enjoy the debate this, uh, this evening. <laughs>
And some of the arguments which I deployed are perfectly applicable to our topic tonight. First, the demographic claim. Wilders said that 25% of Europe will be Muslim just 12 years from now. Now, Abdullah has already dealt with that. I would say lies, damned lies, the statistics, someone said. But my, I'm not going to argue about statistics. My response is simple. If Mr. Wilders or any, um, uh, anyone who wishes to follow his cue in uh, this country wishes to have native Britons, people of British descent, call them what you will, to stay numerically superior, but a simple way. How about encouraging British people, British family, to have more children? To urge them, for example, to give up abortion. There were 195,000 point, 286 abortion in 2008 in this country. And more than 20,000 women under 25 have had an abortion for at least a second time. These are official figures. So what about rejecting this culture of death? We speak, of, we hear a lot about human rights. The right to life is the most fundamental one. What about giving this right to the unborn? Stop bashing Islam. Stop. Um, <coughs> bashing, blaming Islam. Stop blaming Muslims for their birth rate. What is the logic in that? Are Muslims stopping Europeans, British people from having children? The demographic argument is important. I believe it is important. The number is power. But the point of the solution here is to reaffirm the traditional values of Christianity. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer, when I was in parish ministry, I solemnize many marriages, it says the first purpose of marriage is procreation of children. So as an Anglican Christian, I stand by that. My second point, mosques. Uh, Wilder said that thousands of mosques across Europe with larger congregations than churches. Once again, whose fault is it? Do Muslims stand at church door stopping Christians from going in? Certainly not. You know, there was a, a Catholic missionary in the Middle Ages to Baghdad a, at the time of the Crusades, a man called Ricoldo de Monte Croce. And he wrote a book in which praised the Arabs a great deal. And he said, great is among the Muslims their attention to study, devotion in prayer, compassion for the poor, reverence for the name of God and the holy places. He commended the Muslims grave and serious ways, the kindness of strangers, the conquer and the love to each other. And so he, Ricardo, invited Christians actually to admire Muslims for that. Well, uh, I have to say, maybe this is such an idealized picture. Clearly, Baghdad didn't have the sort of uh, murderous fights between Shias and Sufis we have today. But the general point uh, stands for me. What I mean is the flourishing of mosques across Europe or Britain should serve as a stimulus to Christians also to practice their religion. After all, 72% of British people in the last 2001 census declared themselves Christians. So it's up to the church, to a Christian church, to remind the British people of where their life-giving roots are. <coughs> and the government should stop trying to undermine Christianity. Why blame Muslims? of the faults of lukewarm or nominal Christians. It's irrational, it doesn't make sense. Now, I have a discussion of a burqa and I realize that here time is flying away. But here it is not Mr. Wilders, but the Times, a Times editorial recently, it said the, the burqa, a symbol of repression, has no place in a free society. So a free society is one that takes away the freedom to wear certain clothes. And I want to stress, I want to stress that this, of course, is an argument which applies to those who choose voluntarily. I have known some Muslim women who, by their own choice, and I can vouch say that, do wear the burqa. So, even if a pious Muslim woman freely chooses to wear the burqa, even if she's not compelled to do so, uh, she should be stopped. 
You know, what stands, people invoke very often uh, 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 Mill, uh, uh, the, the English uh, uh, writer, who wrote a famous treatise on liberty. But who's, the person who stands behind this intolerant attitude is not Mill, the Englishman, but it's Rousseau, the Frenchman, who said that people should be compelled to be free. Then they should be the state, should be the party, should be a proletarian. You should be powers of a be that force you to go the way you don't want to go. Freedom, my food. So how can you be repressed or oppressed by what you freely choose to wear? It does not, again, it does not make sense. It's a provocation to the values of the Western society. Uh, Sarkozy said so. Well, uh, if it is a provocation, you know, there may be some values which need to be provoked. Maybe from standpoint of faith, I speak as a Christian, and the cross is a great provocation to today's world. It is a provocation to Islam as well, I know, but in this sense, I'm making a general point. Uh, my next point is gays. In Amsterdam, gays are beaten up almost ex exclusively by Muslims, Mr. Wilder says. Well, if it is true, it's awful, and I want to say I totally condemn any violence or discrimination against gays. But I also happen to remember the words of Pim, uh, Pim Fortuyn, the gay right-wing politician who was sadly murdered by a fanatic. He, wrote, he said, I have nothing against Moroccans. I've slept with so many of them. <laughs> so let's be frank. From uh, André Gide to William Barros, the Arab world, parts of the Arab world, have been one of many gays' favorite fun destination. <laughs> Tangier's nickname was Sodom on Sea. So homophobia cannot be all that endemic amongst Arabs. And lastly, identity. And this is one of the topics our own uh, our host suggested tonight for debate. It's a very important point, a necessary one. It is raging on in France at the moment, but it's even a minister of Ponty who discussed national identity and immigration is linked with immigration, which is a very tricky thing to do. But it is, uh, national identity is important insofar as it is linked up to the argument of a discussion of values. Some years ago, the British government started an aborted, uh, pointless debate of values. It got nowhere. Why? In my opinion, because the powers that be were too cowardly to mention religion, particularly Christianity. Remember, 72% of British people describe themselves as Christians. So the history of this country is rooted, actually, in Christianity, in Christian institution. The monarch is the head of a national church. The uh, Church of England is part of a constitutional framework of the country. Uh, how much good it does at the moment under its present uh, liberal sway, I'm not sure, but it is, it is there, and it, should, it is where it should be there to uphold fundamental values. So until actually we recognize that a core value, and with this I'm, I'm sorry to say I agree with uh, uh, Professor Huntington, his famous clash of civilizations. I don't agree with the clash, but I agree that religion is maybe the core value of a civilization. Uh, I asked a friend of mine, a true Brit, unlike me, uh, a question. Helen, tell me, what are these quintessential British values? She thought it a bit, and then she came up with queuing. <laughs> uh, delivering milk bottles with so doorstep in the morning and the like. Well, do Muslims jump the queue? Do they steal your milk bottles? Uh, do they not pay their taxes? Come off it. Uh, the thing is not, as national identity goes deeper than that. It is, if it is threatened today, national identity is threatened by uh, some of the legislation brought in by the British government, such as the ghastly Ed Balls, the non-education secretary who is determined to destroy uh, whatever is valid in the uh, school curriculum. So, I think I'm running on here. I think Paul is looking at me. Paul is looking at me. Thank you, Father Frank, witty as ever. Um, I'd like to invite Robin uh, Tilbrook on my far left to make his contribution. Thank you, Robin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would also like to start by thanking the organizers for making this debate possible and for inviting us to take part. 
I'm the chairman of the English Democrats Party. I ask you, I hear you ask, uh, what are my party's credentials for being part of this debate? Well, the English Democrats are by far the largest English nationalist party. We have some 300, we have some 3,500 members and have stood in most national elections in England since we launched some seven years ago. In the June elections, we got double the votes of our Welsh sister party, Clyde Cymru, and three quarters of the votes of our Scottish sister party, Alex Salmon's SNP, who are in government in Scotland. Also, at 279,801 votes in the EU elections, we were electorally the seventh largest party in England and were well clear of the next tier of parties. In June, we also stood for the first time for a local government directly elected mayoralty in Doncaster and won. Our mayor, Peter Davis, is getting as many good headlines by slashing his mayoral salary from 70,000 to 30,000 and being determined to break the stranglehold of political correctness and of labour corruption in Doncaster and also by following a revolutionary political principle of actually trying to do all the things that he promised to do during the election. I may also have been invited because in 2005 I issued a fatwa against the Liberal Democrats and Vince Cable, <laughs> modelled on the fatwa of Osama bin Laden of jihad against the West, because Vince Cable had claimed and published an article in Demos that the threat to harmonious social relations in Britain comes from those who insist that multiple identity is not possible. White supremacists, English nationalists and Islamic fundamentalists. This is the opposition and they have to be confronted, he said. Anyway, I issued a fatwa suggesting that people shouldn't vote Liberal Democrats. So far, um, with not, not a huge amount of success, but we we're still working on it. But seriously, the English Democrats are a party of the type sometimes called civic nationalists. Let me explain. The word English means many things. It can mean an adjective, something of England, like English countryside. As a noun, it can mean the English language, like saying something in English. It can also mean a nation or ethnicity. In our manifesto, we address this issue head on and we say, the English can be defined in the same way that other nations are defined. To be English is to be part of a community. We English share a communal history, language and culture. We have a common identity and memory. We share a we sentiment, a sense of belonging. These things cannot be presented as, a, as items on a checklist. Our community, like others, has no easily defined boundaries, but we exist and we have the will to continue to exist. And we go on to say, the people of England are all those UK citizens who live in England. In electoral terms, the people of England are all those UK citizens who are on the electoral roll for an English constituency. The people of England therefore includes the people of many nations, all of whom share a common UK citizenship. Now I'm sure you are wondering what I, where I'm going with this. I am saying that a key need in the society is, and indeed even for it to be properly speaking a society at all, is a sense of belonging. In the national context, that is our sense of national identity. This is the sense that makes people from diverse origins living in much of Northern America think of themselves as Americans. And indeed not merely think of themselves as such, but to act as such, that is to act as members of a great national community, a real living, breathing community, not some artificially created community group, beloved of labor for the purpose of breaking us down into labor client groups in a multiculturalist mishmash. What we English Democrats say about multiculturalism is, it is a fact that during the past 40 years, people of many different cultures have come to live in England. Our country is in that sense a multicultural society. However, multiculturalism is an identity, is it, sorry, I beg your pardon, is an ideology which suggests that a mix of many cultures in one society is desirable and that it is the duty of the government to actively encourage cultural diversity within the state. Further, it suggests that all cultures should be treated as equal. A logical extension of that is that all languages, histories and law codes should be treated equally. This is clearly impossible in a, uni in a unified country. All ethnic groups should be free to promote their own cultural identity, but the public culture of England should be that of indigenous English. 
This position is consistent with the rights of indigenous nations everywhere. So the basis of what we English Democrats are therefore saying about English national identity is that what we want to see is a revival of our national sense of belonging and the integration of the people of England into the modern English democratic way of life. It is also our long-standing tradition with some deep roots in our history for England to be tolerant to the practice of religious differences. It is no accident that one of our most zealous born-again Christian leaders, Oliver Cromwell, the man who could write a report to Parliament after one of his victorious battles about the enemy, that God made them a stubble to our swords, it is no accident that he was the ruler who opened England's doors to Jewish immigration. It is also no accident that a country which has an established Christian church and a monarch who is the supreme governor of that church should also, in practice, be one of the most secularist countries in the world. We English are tolerant of religious difference, and the English Democrats are in that tradition of true English liberty. It follows that for us, the problem of Islam is not a great problem for those Muslims who are moderate and want to integrate and to see themselves as English Muslims. We welcome that. The problem is of fundamentalism and of Islamists who want either to convert England into an Islamic state or to have separate legal systems with them being under Sharia law as a sort of apartheid. This is totally unacceptable to us. But we take the view that this represents a small and unrepresentative but dangerous element within Islam, within this country. It is an element, however, that needs to be unequivocally confronted, not only by the criminal justice system when it attempts to stir up hatred and violence or engages in any other criminal activity, but it also needs to be deflated by enabling Muslims whose home is England to have the possibility of sharing our sense of belonging to our English national community. We have therefore welcomed moderate Muslims who support our aims into our party and have indeed been attacked by the BNP for having some as members and candidates. Personally, I think these attacks are quite funny because it was not so very long ago that Nick Griffin was meeting Colonel Gaddafi and Ayatollah Khomeini to try to get Islamist funding for the BNP to campaign against Jews. But then, but then I don't think that the BNP's attack on Islam is really about religion. I think it's really a coded attack on immigrants and on immigration. I say that debates on immigration should not be conducted in that way. I say that all the people of England, whether Christian, Muslim or atheist, have a real interest in immigration being properly controlled, and let us do that calmly, dispassionately, but effectively. And so in answer to the question for debate today, Islamification of Britain, real, reality or myth, the English Democrats say that while it is currently something of a myth, it must be firmly resisted, but in a sensible, moderate and common sense, tolerant, and typically English way, which welcomes integration and welcomes Muslims who should in their turn be expected to integrate into our society and our nation. And let us, in a common sense and good neighbourly way, create a positive sense of English national community within England. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Robin. And finally, but far from being the least of all, I'd like to invite Andrew Copson to give his contribution. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh. Well, my problem, uh, the problem of being the last person to speak in an hour-long uh, discussion is compounded for me by being the only person on this side of the table who doesn't have anyone's divine name in which to welcome you. Um, so I'll simply have to say for my part, uh, Thanks again to the Muslim uh, Debate Initiative uh, for setting up uh, this discussion. The first thing I want to say uh, is that Islamification, uh, whatever that means, and I don't think it actually means very much, um, is not happening. Um, the statistics of uh, birth rates and demography have been dealt with by other speakers, um, but it's enough to say, I think, that those who peddle uh, the myth of Islamification uh, make much of the increase uh, in the population uh, of those who are Muslim and totally overplay it. Um, and in their language, quite wrongly, uh, for a start, categorize Muslims together, when of course there is great diversity amongst those uh, calling themselves Muslims, not only because they're culturally diverse, 
um, but also uh, because not all those calling themselves Muslim and taking that identity for themselves are particularly, uh, if at all, religious, while some, of course, uh, very much are. And it's wrong, quite wrong, to assume uh, that Muslims, because they're Muslims, will be opposed to secular democracy or to the liberal state. Um, and it is very wrong, and this is extremely important, um, to suggest that all those who are born as the children of Muslims or the grandchildren of Muslims in this great demographic change that's going to flood in on us in the rhetoric from uh, the Islamification side of things will be Muslims themselves if the pattern of falling away from uh, religion that has occurred and is occurring amongst the populations of Europe uh, keeps up, there's every reason to believe that the descendants of current British Muslims may not be Muslims at all. Um, and in fact, uh, that is also not in taken into account by the, those who wish to mythologize um, an Islamification that is to come. Well, social change is unsettling. It is unsettling. Um, but diversity is ultimately enriching, I think. And our response to change, demographic or otherwise, shouldn't be um, to relapse into ever more exclusive religious identities, if you're Christian or Muslim, or to relapse into some sort of political extremism. Um, it is undoubtedly the case that uh, those countries in the world today where Islamic law is implemented are amongst the very worst. They're not, of course, the only uh, human rights violators, where life is cheapened. Um, by a very scant regard for human freedom. But this situation, I think, is highly unlikely uh, to arise in Britain. And so far, for example, the immigration uh, that this country has seen and the increasing levels of, of immigrants coming to this country um, have gone hand in hand, has gone hand in hand and been accompanied by a decrease in racism and all sorts of other uh, positive attitudinal change amongst the population as a whole. I don't see any reason why that shouldn't continue. I'm speaking here as a, as a humanist, one who believes uh, politically in human rights, democracy, and the rule of law as the basis of a liberal society and a secular approach to our shared public life. And liberals, uh, in this sense, uh, or in my sense, are attacked uh, really from both sides um, by those uh, Islamic extremists who do demonstrate with posters saying democracy go to hell or the other sort of ludicrous overplayed slogans um, that we see there and also by extremists of the nationalist right who blame liberals uh, for cravenly giving up their democratic birthright in the face of Islamification so I'm a little stuck in the middle um, but ultimately I think it is liberalism a strong liberalism um, that will create uh, and maintain a society of free individuals <coughs> And that includes uh, those who are free to freedom to worship, freedom of expression, uh, freedom to critically uh, assess political and religious ideologies that will in the long run be cohesive for all of us. And these concepts, these liberal concepts, provide a framework uh, within which we can live together in a society that is diverse because they provide an essential basis for a shared civic identity. And that's my argument. That's, the, I think, the distinctiveness of my position this evening. We are a society, and the actions of every one of us um, affect our fellow citizens. So there are things that we are uh, not permitted to do, arising out of the commitments we have to each other. There's no uh, justification, I think, for systems of Sharia law to enter English law, or to settle disputes if those systems violate human rights standards and are anything other than voluntary arrangements freely entered into uh, on civil matters. There's no justification for incitement to racist hatred or to the hatred of any individual um, or group of people. And if we're true to those principles, it seems to me, and use them to frame public discussion of these issues, and especially of issues like this one that are extremely controversial, then I think we can, I believe, we can uh, begin to move to resolve them. And the second part um, of what I want to say is that in spite of what I've said, is that there is always a need for those who support freedom, uh, who support democracy and the rule of law and human rights to be vigilant. And we do need a strong liberalism in order to do that, to perform that task. I think it's unlikely, as I've said, that our democratic institutions and our liberal society are going to be usurped any time soon uh, in the way that is uh, projected uh, on the other side of this argument. But I think we do run the risk of destabilizing 
our democratic institutions and disrupting the habits of freedom if we don't firstly understand where they come from, which I think is from uh, the liberal uh, democratic tradition, if we don't defend them in the face of ideologies that seek to tear them down by whomever those ideologies are expressed and whatever those ideologies are, political or religious or whatever. And if we don't thirdly use those institutions and the freedoms we have to negotiate our way through the consequences of the demographic change that we're experiencing. And this change does produce tensions. The stories uh, that our panelists from the British National Party read out um, caused a lot of scoffing uh, in the audience. Um, and, but we can't deny that they're out there in the public sphere and they tend to fuel fear and they must uh, be dealt with uh, head on and discussed uh, in a sensible way um, and not uh, simply disregarded. I think we need education uh, an education that will inform everyone of the basis of our shared citizenship and our freedoms as individuals in Britain and Europe. And we need a better recognition of how liberal secularism protects people of every religious and non-religious belief to be free and to follow that path of human flourishing that they have chosen for themselves, providing they're not harming others. And in a way, I'm at odds with everyone else um, on the panel uh, in one way or another. Um, I certainly don't agree, for example, with the singling out of Muslims for criticism by the British National Party, nor their views on family values. Um, I think Abdullah's account of history is a little bit subjective, um, and that he's totally wrong about the superiority of, uh, of the Sharia over liberal democracy. Um, and, and incidentally, I even would say that I don't just care about the freedom of people in, in, in Europe, but also in, in those countries in the Arab world where also I think that the Sharia law uh, is not justified, whether there are many people in that country who happen to be Muslim or not. I think Alan is quite wrong um, to locate British values uh, as Christian values. And though I understand um, the discomfort caused by veiled faces and feel it sometimes myself in social interactions of various sorts, I don't believe you can prevent people wearing the clothes they freely choose to wear in a free society. And I certainly don't believe that everyone should be encouraged to have as many children as possible um, and women denied autonomy over their own bodies and that the Church of England should go on some massive reconversion of the people um, of the correct ethnic origin uh, in this country today. And I'm also at odds with uh, those Islamic extremists who are not represented here on the panel uh, tonight um, who might, for example, argue that Islamification is happening and is a good thing. And I've met such people and discussed with them in the past. So I am here, though, to say that it is a distraction to relapse into extremist ideologies of any sort, especially at this time, and negative self-identifications that are divisive. We do need a shared civic sense that will be robust enough to accommodate all our diverse religious and non-religious beliefs, a robust framework in a liberal and a secular sense. Thank you very much, Alan, and apologies, uh, Andrew.